I'm nervous. <laughs> it's really often, okay. it's really often that I speak in front of crowds of strangers, but it's not often I get to speak in front of a crowd of people that I know so well. So this is really an honor to come back to Goldsboro and speak to you guys and kind of tell you what in the world I've been up to for the past uh, about 15 years. So thank you. Hi, Kay. I have a few questions for you, and then I'm sure this group has plenty of questions for you. This is the first one. What in the world exactly does a casting director do? Yeah, what does a casting director do? Sure, 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 sure. Um, yeah, what, what does a casting director do? Uh, well, I'll speak specifically to what a casting director does for, for theater, because casting directors exist kind of in all mediums of entertainment, whether it be TV, film, commercials, or in the case uh, of me, with, with Broadway plays and musicals. Uh, a, a casting director essentially is a headhunter. I am a headhunter for actors, and I'm hired by Broadway producers to keep their shows fully employed. So for example, I cast Chicago the Musical on Broadway, right? Which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, at least the movie, starring Catherine Zeta-Jones, Renee Zellweger, and uh, Richard Gere. Uh, the Broadway musical's been running for 22 years. Uh, it's actually, it's the second longest running show in the history of theater, family opera being the longest, which I believe is now at like 27 or 28 years. We're clocking in, uh, it'll be 23 years this November. I've been working on it for the past nine years. And for the past nine years, basically my job is to always make sure that the 24 contracts that are the actors in that building at the Ambassador Theater in New York City are always filled. And so, you know, with a show like Chicago, the revolving door is pretty constant. Uh, we are constantly looking for new headliners to come into the show that are going to get good press for us and sell tickets. And then, of course, we're always looking to, uh, to refill the ensemble tracks in the shows with uh, new talent that's moved to town. Uh, someone gets another job, and so I need to uh, replace them. Someone gets pregnant. Someone breaks their foot. It's kind of a constant, uh, it, it's a constant job to keep Chicago fully employed. But what I do is uh, I go all over the country and audition people that are graduating from top uh, theater programs all over the country. I meet them when they're still in school. Not too dissimilar from like what someone that works at Google or Facebook would do today, right? They send headhunters to the top universities all over the country. They meet the graduates before they move to New York and they try to actually set them up with future prospective employers. So I, I do that specifically for a handful of shows that I am hired to be the headhunter slash casting director for. And so it's my job to always just have, have a, an, a Rolodex of actors that are ready at any given time, whether it be Benton, we're looking for someone to understudy the role of Billy Flynn. He must be at least 5'9". He should appear over the age of 30. He needs to be a baritone that can hit a high A, right? So I actually have a database where I can literally go in and type in male, 30 plus, baritone, high A, and literally pull up all of the files of people that I've met, in my case, over the past 10 years. And then from there, narrow it down to an actual like manageable number of people, bring them into an audition room, audition them on the material, and then share them with the creative team and the producers to select that kind of final person that's going to get the job. So in a nutshell, that's what a casting director does, right? So Chicago is an example of like a pre-existing show that's been around for a really long time. But another part of my job is developing new musicals, new shows that don't have movies that they're based off, that don't have books they're based off, that just have the brand new script that just the writer has just written fresh off the press. And it's my job to read that script and to actually imagine with the creative team, with the writers, what would this person look like in person? How do we want to cast the show? What is the direction? You know, because it so informs the shows you see. Think about, let's, let's go even broader and look at television. Think about television shows and the styles of actors that you see on TV. If you take a show like This Is Us on NBC, right? I'm sure many of you probably watch it. It's wonderful. It's actually cast out of New York City, and the bulk of the actors on it are actors that I've hired before for Broadway plays and musicals. But the actors in, those show, in the show This Is Us, they all have a very real feeling, don't they? They don't seem like glossy, kind of, you know, they, they don't seem like 
Sandra Bullock and Tom Cruise, right? They're not like the hyper airbrushed, beautiful, you know, celebrity actors. They're more people that look like they could be your next door neighbor. They could be your friend, right? And that's the style of, of talent that that show actually goes after. Whereas you take a show like, oh, let's say a television show on, on the CW, like Riverdale, right? Which is a television show that's way more about hiring very pretty people that are, are being hired to kind of give you a romanticized view of the world, a not realistic view of the world, an entertaining view of the world, but very different from the actors that you would see in a show like This Is Us. And so that all comes down to, to the casting director and the kinds of people that they're bringing in to actually bring these characters to life. And so that's what I do on a daily basis for, for old shows like On the Town or Chicago or brand new musicals that I'm developing like Hades Town or The Great Comet of 1812, which we'll get into in a bit. But that, does that make sense? Okay, yeah, sort of, yeah. And now that, that you've mentioned where he ended up, I'd like for you to go back to the 80s and the 90s, and I want to know about the path that you took. Sure. Okay. How in the world did I become a casting director? Did this kid been. from Goldsboro <laughs> end up yeah, casting Broadway musicals? It's, it's a weird journey, but I, I thought maybe we'd first, like, we'd do a little slideshow and, like, talk through kind of like Benton Whitley, 1990. Let's do that. What do I press here? This button? Hi, right, here we go. Great. <laughs> So this is my family. This is this guy that I kind of look like now. This is my father. Uh, and my mom. This is my brother, Wyatt. Uh, this picture was probably taken in like 1987, would be my guess. I'm probably about two or three years old in that picture. Uh, but this is kind of where it all began. Uh, so as a kid, I definitely uh, was uh, an actor because what do you do with a four-year-old? You don't say, go cast a Broadway musical. You say get up on that table and sing a song for me. So that's where I started. And even, even before uh, the kind of formal theater world began, I already was obsessed with, with costumes and make-believe. And I have such fond memories as a kid of just of, of putting on a costume and, and, and transforming myself to another time, another world, and, and another person. And these are some fun examples. Uh, I think this down here at the bottom, this is an angel at church, uh, the United Methodist in Fremont. I think this maybe is a Halloween. And then I think this, this must be Thanksgiving. Yeah, it says November 26th, the Pilgrims and Indians. Uh, yep, it went on up. So here's my first dance partner, Paige Stewart, right down here in the bottom left-hand corner. This is at Goldsboro Country Club. I think we're probably dancing to like a Charlie Brown Christmas or something like that. Uh, my obsession with Peter Pan actually began even before I did Peter Pan at, at this, uh, on this campus actually, right here at Wayne Community. Uh, yep, but that's where we'll start. We'll start with Peter Pan. So in 1992, stage struck. I uh, was just a year old. I remember uh, my mom taking me to see Annie in 1991 and looking up on that stage and knowing that, well, kind of thinking I wanted to be Annie, to be completely honest with you. <laughs> uh, but knowing that I, I, I wanted to do that and that, that that was definitely one of the most exciting things I had seen to date. And so I'm sure I probably spent the next year just talking about wanting to audition for Peter Pan, but I, I vividly remember going in and auditioning for it. Um, oh, this is the actual, uh, this is the bios and the playbill. Here's my bio. Benton Whitley, age six, is a first grader at North Drive School. He's the son of Witten Candy Whitley. Benton's past stage experiences, I already had some at age six, were buttons and bows, crime stoppers, and the nutcracker. Benton has more fun entertaining than being entertained. <laughs> that sounds like something my mother would have written about me in 1992. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, so, so a year or two before this, uh, the Goldsboro Arts Council used to do this really wonderful thing that I'm sure many of you remember called Buttons and Bows that Lee Brown put on every summer. And Lee Brown is definitely my, my first, she was the first point of contact for me uh, to the world of, of acting on a stage as a kid. And I think maybe I was even four, not even five yet, uh, like the summer of 89 at Herman Park Center. Uh, the, the review Buttons and Bows was being put on that year. And she assigned the song, I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy to me, which is this old uh, Gershwin song. I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy, a Yankee Doodle Dandy. Anyway, there's a lyric in it that says, born on the 4th of July. 
my birthday is July 3rd. So we changed the lyric to July 3rd, and I thought that was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> uh, but going back to Peter Pan, uh, this is Katie Hobbs on the left here, uh, who I believe still lives in North Carolina. Um, and this is me flying on the right. So a really amazing opportunity that Sage Struck had in 1992 as they, they found the resources to actually bring the flying company that flew Peter Pan on Broadway to Goldsboro and have us fly. And so, you know, that show just, it, it, was, it was kind of the perfect storm for me because, I mean, what's cooler to a six-year-old than actually getting to fly in the air? I mean, like that is, I still dream today about flying. Um, so getting to do that then, I think, really was the perfect springboard into going into the world of theater that came before it. Uh, so here, here are lots of pictures of me from Peter Pan, just being silly. This photo actually, this photo is hysterical that we actually have this. That's Holly Mason and Jan Archer, the director and assistant director of Peter Pan. And this is opening night uh, of the show and they are coming to give me a note because the night before at the final dress rehearsal, six-year-old Benton thought that in the final scene of Peter Pan, a scene that's only supposed to be between Peter Pan and grown-up Wendy, 20 years later, Michael Darling, the role I played, should be an adult by now. He should not exist. It's this final scene of talking about never growing up. I decided I'd just walk out on stage. <laughs> and I just without asking, opened the nursery door and just walked from stage left to stage right, picked up my teddy bear, and walked uh, back off stage. And I thought that was a completely reasonable thing for me to do. I wanted a little bit more stage time. <laughs> and Holly Mason and Jane Archer had to sit me down and explain to me that they just like, that's not allowed. You can't <laughs> do that. And I, I remember being pretty upset by it. And I love that somebody photographed it. It's <laughs> amazing. It's still here. Ah, oh, yeah, so these are things outside of uh, stage struck. So on the left here, this is my attempt to try to be a dancer, uh, which I never was. But on the left, uh, my mom uh, put my brother and I both in tap classes. And this is my tap recital. I believe I'm a dinosaur. And I don't know if you remember this, mom, but actually, specifically, I chose not to wear underwear underneath my unitard because I didn't like the way that it like bunched up in my yellow unitard. And I thought that was totally OK. I just you know, messed with my line, I guess. Uh, and uh, afterwards, uh, when I went off stage, I had like four mothers just completely jump on me because I guess the stage lights from, <laughs> from the audience just gave this very clear view and quickly put me in underwear. Um, <laughs> And then on the left here, this is a, a, this is a Missoula Children's Theater show, which is a, a children's theater company that came through town and put on shows. This is Beauty Lou and the Country Beast. And Joyce Wooten, uh, I convinced her that I was allowed to audition. I had specifically been told by my parents that I was not allowed to be in the show, that I uh, was doing too many other things, and it was time to let other kids have an opportunity. Like, you audition for everything, Benton. You're not allowed to do this. And I pretended like I heard her. And Joyce picked me up from school, and Melissa was going to audition for it. And I told her that I was too. And I think, like, you maybe stumbled a bit. You're like, I thought you said your mother said you couldn't come. It's like, no, she told me I could. <laughs> I went. I was casting the show. Yep. Uh, yeah, Wizard of Oz, 1995. Uh, this is the first of two finger incidents that happened. So when I was in the third grade, I got my, uh, the tip of my finger cut off, which you can actually see right here in this picture, the bandage on it, which my father, the veterinarian, used multicolor animal uh, adhesive tape to wrap it and like, create like fun, munchkin-appropriate designs on every day. Uh, but that is The Wizard of Oz. Right, and so just more shows over the years. There was production of Oliver. We did Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Oh, one back. Go back again. Uh, Annie, so this was the 10th anniversary show. And this was the beginning of me really realizing the importance of, of creative teams. And really, probably the first moment when I realized around age 13 that there was more to just being an actor on stage. It was this show when I realized this was a, this was a Herculean uh, production that Stage Struck did. To date, at this time, 
It was their 10th anniversary show, and they had never put on a bigger show, for sure. It was something we all were so proud of, and all of our parents worked so hard on, everyone from the set designer, the costume designer, the producers, the stage managers, everyone. And, and it, was, it was really at that moment when I realized that there were so many other things that someone in the world of theater could do and, and be good at and be passionate about besides just being an actor on the stage. We did Hello, Dolly. We did Camelot. Let's see. This, that's Oklahoma up the left-hand corner. That's me as a 15-year-old trying to be an 80-year-old. That's old age makeup. Uh, this is Crystal Hodges down here at the bottom, who I believe is still here in Goldsboro and actually working with Sage Struck and Guys and Dolls. Oh, that's Paige again. And this is uh, a production of Joseph. Uh, that's the Benjamin Calypso up in the top right-hand corner. Uh, more products. That's Annie on the left. Annie at the bottom. That's my mom who did the costumes for Hello, Dolly. Uh, and this is the boyfriend. So a funny story with Kay Cook and the boyfriend actually happened. When we were, were we auditioning for it, Kay? Yeah. We were auditioning for it, and Kay was teaching us the, uh, the classic Charleston dance, the 1920s social dance, uh, which involves a lot of kicking. And I, I believe, if I remember correctly, like there were maybe like 40 kids uh, in a square footage space that should have had maybe more like 10 kids, but we fit 40 in there. And Kay was trying her best to wrangle all of us, teaching us all how to do the Charleston. And I just, overzealous, just kicked my foot and broke her toe. Broke, her, broke your finger, excuse me, yeah. Bro broke her right hand, yeah. Did I actually like fracture the bone? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I did. Yep. And here we are. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, these are my first professional headshots. This is when I convinced my parents that they need to spend the money to, to, to get, get uh, big boy headshots of me so that I could start auditioning for, for stuff outside of Goldsboro. Uh, this is Cinderella. And then the other stuff that was, was happening in addition to all the stage truck stuff were the other, the other organizations in Wayne County that I was a part of, which uh, Goldsboro Ballet was, was one that Paige always dragged me back to. Uh, I think I like, went through a cycle of literally being like a friend of Fritz, Fritz, the Nutcracker, the Prince, Drosselmeyer. Like literally just like aged <laughs> through them all the way up. Um, and then also Center Stage Theater uh, here in town. I, I did a few shows with them as well. At, at, as being like one of the only kids, kids in the show. Uh, but then also, it was, it was my things outside of theater, uh, outside of acting on the stage that really made me start to get into the business savvy part of, of, of how I could maybe shape this into a career. And so at Charles B. Acock, I started doing, the, uh, started doing some marketing and business clubs. I did DECA and Skills USA VICA which are, are you know, the nerdy business clubs that, that kids do and have nothing to do with theater at all. But it, I didn't even realize at the time what I was doing, but I was already beginning to kind of shape the job for me that I would eventually do, which is kind of the, the, the blend of both entertainment and business in one. And then more stuff. And then uh, I uh, was a Boy Scout, and I, I, I sang in church, and I uh, even tried sports. Uh, I played soccer and tennis, something that my brother really excel, excelled at and uh, I more was present for. <laughs> um, and then in high school, um, I, I went to Governor's School, which is, is, is such an amazing free uh, opportunity for kids in North Carolina. And that was, that was really my first exposure of, of leaving Wayne County and starting to see other people from across the state and see that there are other people just like me in other tiny towns across the state who had the same dreams and, and passions as I did. I also went to this uh, NHSI as the National High School Institute, which is at Northwestern U University uh, in Evanston, Illinois. I went to a summer camp there as well for theater. But all of that led me to University of North Carolina School of the Arts, which is in Winston-Salem, which again was another free opportunity. I remember uh, convincing my dad that he had to let me go because it was going to actually save him money by sending me there because room and board was included. So I got three meals a day, three square meals that he didn't pay for. And I, I was convinced that was the reason why he actually let me go. Uh, but it was, it was at North Carolina School of the Arts where I really realized just the potential of, of 
the professional world of entertainment and, and that it is an actual achievable uh, world that I could enter. Oh yeah, this is when I came back after that, my senior year of high school, and we did a, a benefit for Stage Struck uh, at the Paramount Theater with Brian Letchworth, a classmate of mine and a friend who grew up with me here. And then I went to the University of Michigan. Uh, and it really was in Michigan where, where I now have, ha have made the network of people that I still work with today on, on a daily basis. That, that's it. That, that's, that's the photo slide version of, <laughs> of me. Well, just one quick question. If like Ann Hunter or Tom Jarrett wants to audition, do they just, For, just, just like hang out afterwards? Yeah, I'm sure someone can play the piano. We can just set up and just do 16 bars. In fact, Tom Casey said, oh, I'm so excited. He already told me. Totally. What do you see that's had a big impact and where it's going? Right. Um, well, theater has changed so much. I mean, theater, uh, the, the audience for theater uh, has changed drastically. Theater, Broadway musicals really didn't come about until the 19, in, in, in what we view as a Broadway musical today, didn't really come about until the late 1930s, early 40s, with Rodgers and Hart uh, and Gershwin. And originally, Broadway musicals were the, were the palate cleanser to opera and ballet. So the, the people of New York City that you know, went to the very high end, very uh, legitimate uh, opera and ballet world, they would love to go to the Saturday matinee of a Broadway show because it was easy and fun and, uh, and it was fluff. And as you can imagine, that's majorly changed today because, frankly, people don't go to the ballet and opera anymore. I mean, the ballet and opera in New York still do exist, but their, their seasons, the, the ballet in New York used to run every night, uh, all 12 months of the year. The ballet in New York now only runs just for segmented months and weeks throughout the year, and the same with opera. Uh, and so theater now really has become more of the, uh, the go-to entertainment form for the people that once went and saw ballet and opera. Um, but unfortunately, uh, over the past, I'd say, you know, 20 or 30 years, there have been very few shows that have transcended the theater audience to pull in new people. Because frankly, most people my age don't go to the theater. But if you ask most people that were born in the 80s and, and, and since, Theater is not an, an average, a normal part of their life. It's not, oh, let's go spend, you know, a lot of money and, and, and go see an okay show. Uh, so it, it, is, it, is not, it does not have the same audience that it once had. But there have been some really successful shows in recent years that have started to change that. And one of them, of course, is Hamilton, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, which is, I mean, the biggest thing theater has ever seen. And what I mean by that is that the show ha is, has only existed for about three years, and it has brought in more money than Family Opera has brought in in the 27 years that it has brought uh, uh, on, on Broadway. In the 27 years that Family Opera has been on Broadway, Hamilton collectively in the past, I think it's now four years that it's been uh, running in various incarnations, has surpassed it. So why? Why does that show work? You know, and, and for those of you that have seen it or have at least listened to the cast recording of it, the music is, uh, it sounds like something you'd hear on the radio. And, and that is really rare that we find Broadway shows that actually successfully capture a music moment in time, which it, it has, is what Hamilton has done, but also still stands on the foundation and legitimacy of classic theater storytelling. You go see it and you could compare Hamilton to Carousel. You could compare Hamilton to Shakespeare, frankly, because the, the writers of the show really structurally stuck to it and made sure that they actually used the, you know, the, the classic art form to tell this story of Alexander Hamilton, but doing it with pop music. This sounds like a song that Bruno Mars would sing on the radio. And uh, it, it is wildly, wildly successful, and it has brought in new people to the theater that would never have come before. And it has introduced people to the theater that now have a passion for it that never would have had a passion for it. 
Uh, I get to, to work with, with students all over the country, and, and it definitely, they're all un unanimously obsessed with Hamilton and a show called Dear Evan Hansen that uh, won the Tony two years ago on Broadway that will be playing at the Deepak next month. And those two shows have really, they, ha they are the two that are killing it uh, in, in terms of box office receipts and, and also bringing in new audiences to the theater. Did that answer your question? Yeah. What did you ask? Like <laughs> how, how expensive is show? I don't think we appreciate exactly Yeah, sure. They're so expensive, and that's part of the problem, too. Um, Broadway musicals, uh, they range. You know, it, it varies on, on the size of them. But for example, I can tell you this. Um, Wicked, in 2002, I believe the initial budget for that musical was $12 million in 2002. And what I mean by $12 million is, is it costs $12 million to get it up to opening night. So that's all the development of it, that's the rehearsal, that's you know, paying the writers, paying the actors, renting the theater, building the set, building the costumes, creating a marketing plan, marketing it to audiences, all of that. They spend every penny of that $12 million on opening night. And then after that, Everything after that is just repaying that $12 million slowly but surely. So like a musical like Wicked, which in 2002 was the biggest thing on Broadway, huge, huge hit, it would bring in, it would be the biggest cash cow on Broadway at the time, and it would bring in about a million dollars a week in ticket sales. But the running cost of the show costs somewhere around seven hundred dollars to $750,000 a week to run the show. So basically that means that they made profit of $250,000. So they slowly start paying back that $12 million investment with $250,000 a week, right? So Wicked is, is, is definitely the exception. Wicked is a show that they, every week, they, they recouped very quickly. They made back that $12 million. But most Broadway shows are not that lucky. Most Broadway shows don't bring in a million dollars a week. So that Wicked sold every seat in the theater every performance eight times a week at full price, no discounted tickets. And so that's why it made that revenue so high. But most Broadway shows bring in anywhere around four hundred dollars to $500,000 a week. And that's really, that's great that they're able to do that. And their running cost is still probably like $500,000. Like they break even. It really is, it's not a money-making business uh, for most people. Someone wise once said to me, you can't make a living in theater, but you can make a killing in theater. And uh, that has always stuck with me because uh, I am, I mean, I, I definitely am not making a killing living in theater, but I'm figuring out how to make a living and that doesn't feel like the normal route for people. Uh, but theater is so expensive. The normal ticket prices for a Broadway show range anywhere between $80 and for the cheapest seat in the house, the back row of the balcony, to the most expensive seats downstairs, they can be anywhere between $300 and $700 a ticket. So unfortunately, it really prices out the majority of people. And, um, and that's a, a huge issue that we continue to face uh, as, as people producing theater, is how in the world do we ever expect you know, to find new audiences for this? Because why would anyone ever want to spend that much money in the first place to take a risk on it? Um, when you're in this um, wonderful American culture of Broadway, um, who is it that you get Sure, totally. Who is it that you come across that? That I have to like keep my cool and pretend like I'm not being yeah. starstruck because a big part of my job is 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 hanging out and communicating with 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 starry people for sure, and it's something I've had to kind of numb myself to. Uh, well, you know, my musical theater hero, which we haven't spoken about yet, but the first person I really, really became very obsessed with in the musical theater world as a kid was Stephen Schwartz. Excuse me. Stephen Sondheim. Uh, and Stephen Sondheim, of course, he wrote the lyrics to West Side Story. He wrote the lyrics to Gypsy. And then he went on to write Sweeney Todd, Into the Woods, um, Company, uh, a slew of musicals. And in 1999, I believe it was 99, maybe 2000, Center Stage did a production of Into the Woods, which is basically an adult version of the Grimm's fairy tales. It mixtures, it mixes all, all, all of the characters, the princesses and the princes and the big bad wolf and Cinderella all into one story. And in that I played Jack from Jack and the Beanstalk. And uh, Joyce Keller, uh, who I went to church with at the time, had a VHS of the original Broadway production 
that she lent to me. And this was pre-YouTube, pre-Netflix that didn't exist. You know, Blockbuster definitely did not have a copy of Into the Woods at it, for sure. And uh, she lent me that copy of Into the Woods. And I, she told me that I had to give it back to her once I watched it. And I actually found it in my closet this morning in Goldsboro, <laughs> North Carolina, when I was digging through just trying to just find memories. And there that VHS was. I swear I'm going to return it to you, Joyce. <laughs> um, but I watched it nonstop. I became it just, it, it, it was, it's such a wonderful production. And the music and lyrics in it are so fantastic. And so that began my lifelong obsession with Stephen Sondheim. And when I was a junior in college uh, at University of Michigan, I came to New York for the summer to do an internship for a Broadway producer. And that Broadway producer that year was producing a revival of Sweeney Todd that was playing on Broadway. And at the end of the summer, after slaving away for four months as an intern, not being paid a penny, uh, just hoping to absorb as much as possible, Typically, they would send interns off on their way on the last day with like a gift card to Bed Bath & Beyond, to buy new sheets for their you know, dorm room. But instead, they knew that they could give me something way, way better than that. And so they put me in a car, a taxi, and they told the taxi driver the address. And they told me that there would be someone at the other end to answer the door. And they drove me downtown to 29th Street between 3rd and 4th Avenue to a beautiful street of brownstones. I had no idea where I was, and I really had no clue who I could possibly be about to meet. And I went up and rang the doorbell, and answering the door was Stephen Sondheim in sweatpants and a t-shirt, apologizing to me that he had already sent his cook home for the day. He wished that he had been told earlier that I would be coming because she would have, he would have had her cook me dinner, and now I just had to deal with his poor cooking. And we went into his storied home that he built him that he built in 1960 with the money that Gypsy gave him, and he proceeded to cook me grilled chicken breasts and asparagus, and asked me if I liked vodka Red Bull because that's what all the kids were drinking at the time. Stephen Sondheim today, I believe that he is now 91 years old, just for your point of reference. So this was, 10, this was 12 years ago. He was in his late 70s. Uh, so I hate vodka Red Bulls, but that day I loved vodka Red Bulls. <laughs> and I, I'm sure I got drunk. God, 20, I was 21. I was 21, thank God. Uh, that was the summer I turned 21. I, I proceeded to drink vodka Red Bulls with Stephen Sondheim in his brownstone as I ate dried out Greg, uh, grilled chicken breasts. And he proceeded to tell me the proper pronunciation of my name, Benton. Uh, because he is a wordsmith, he, you know, he writes music and lyrics for a living, he's won tons of awards doing it. And he, he looked right at me and he's like, Benton, do you know the origin of your name? Of course, at the time I, I maybe did, but not fully. And he proceeded to actually go through the actual history of the name Benton and history of the name Whitley and everything that he knew about both of them. And also the, the proper pronunciation of how you actually say Benton and not Benton. The T is actually silent because it's old English. So I love telling people now that when people would say, hey, Benton, I'm like it's actually Benton. It's Benton. <laughs> Stephen Sondheim says Benton. Exactly. So I don't know if it'll ever top that. I mean, getting to meet, you know, my childhood idol at 21. Um, another really big one for me uh, was in, in, in my first year in New York, um, I got to help cast uh, Bette Midler was doing her, she at the time was doing a residency in Las Vegas, and she was hiring backup singers to uh, sing backup for her. And I, I was working for the casting office that was doing that. And I, on the final day, when Bette was going to come in and see the final uh, options of ladies that the casting director had narrowed it down to, uh, the casting director asked me if I wanted to come and run the door that day and kind of be you know, the gopher at the Bette Midler auditions. And so Bette Midler came, I mean, you know, with not a, like a stitch of makeup on her face glasses, her hair pulled back in like a banana clip, mom jeans way up right underneath her boobs, uh, and those dance co like clogs, those orthopedic shoes that are like super comfortable, but definitely not like chic in a bed bibber sort of way at all. Uh, you wouldn't recognize her, frankly, like you would walk, her, walk past her on the street and not be like, oh, there goes bed bibber, definitely not. 
Uh, but sitting in that room and watching that Midler stand up and sing with these ladies all one at a time, she would just stand there with her eyes closed, with her arms crossed, singing the song. One of her big hits was uh, Do You Wanna Dance? It was one of her big songs. And I actually remember listening to that song along with a lot of other Bette Midler songs when I was a kid with my mom in the minivan driving around Eastern North Carolina, um, listening, belting Bette Midler show tunes uh, to, to be in that room, you know, uh, 15, 17 years later after that and watch her just sing to herself. She wasn't performing for anybody. She, we you know, might as well not have been in the room with her. But to watch her just kind of do her thing so casually really made me realize, wow, I really have such a, such a unique point of view to, to get to be in a room with these legends and, and, and not treat them like legends and treat them like normal people and watch what they do when they're not in front of an audience of 2,000 people is, is such a cool experience. And, and for the theater nerd in me that, that is unapologetic, it's just all the extra special. Well, I would like to open up to the last 10 minutes questions for all of you. I've been asking questions, and I'm sure there's people that have questions. No, I am not interested. Ignorance is bliss. And let me tell you, now being on the other side of it and really seeing that it so often comes down to the to the brass tacks of nothing to do with the actual talent that an actor has, but has everything to do with a million other things that are out of control for the actor, really makes me now have no desire to perform. Still sing in my shower, still sing in my apartment, um, but, but no, not, not in public. It's kind of, it's, um, it, it, it would be a conflict of interest uh, as a casting director, sadly. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, sure. Broadway HD is this new thing that you guys can actually rent on, I believe, like Amazon Prime has it, and maybe even Netflix has it. Definitely, if you just go Google it, you'll see. HD is in high definition. They now are filming Broadway shows so that you can watch them. They're like professionally filming them uh, and showing them even in movie theaters. In New York City, they often actually air them first in movie theaters before releasing them online. Uh, but it's actually, it's really helped the art form. At first, people, the really big theater aficionados, were very offended by the idea of filming a Broadway show. Uh, but ultimately, I mean, there are so many people that never get the opportunity to actually go to New York City and see a Broadway show. And so I have no doubt that there, there is many a kid, you know, it, it's somewhere far, far, far away from New York City that is experiencing their first Broadway show via... Broadway HD, so I really support it. I think it's wonderful. I mean, the power that the VHS of Into the Woods did to me in 1998, I can't imagine what it does for, for kids today. So I think it's great. No, thank goodness. I don't deal with the money at all. So I do deal, I do, I do know what the budget is. And I have to then advise my producers in the direction of, of pointing them towards actors they can afford. <laughs> uh, because, you know, quite often how it works typically in that budget of like I told you that Wicked costs, you know, $12 million, uh, there will be this budget of, you know, X amount of dollars that they are, can spend on casting. And so it often is up to the casting director and the producer to kind of figure out the puzzle of the money of like we're going to allot, you know, 20% of the budget to the headliner and we're going to allot the other 80% to all the other actors. And so I am often that guy that I have to tell Broadway producers they can't afford the actor they want. Because, of course, every, every Broadway producer wants to just have household names in their shows to sell tickets, but they never want to pay for it. You know, they have the taste of champagne with a budget of beer. So I, I, I don't ever have to deal with it on the actor front, but I do deal with it internally, kind of explaining to producers why they can and cannot afford certain actors. Yes, sir. This question comes from an older man. But it seems to me like all of the classical good questions is 100, uh, 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. Many of the great people are 40 to 80. Mm -hmm. 
Right. So I, I think that, I mean, I think the musical style has changed, and it's taken theater a long time to catch up with it. I think that, that the American musical has been behind on keeping up with the trends of music. So, I mean, shows are still written in the classic style. There are still brand new musicals that open on Broadway every year that if you were to listen to them, you would actually maybe think they were written in 1945. They're written in the style, right, in a pastiche style. Uh, but do I think there's a drought? I mean, I think that now theater is pushed towards uh, producing franchises. And I think that you see movies on stage a lot more now than you see uh, original musicals, unfortunately. You'll see, you know, you, Disney is a wonderful example. Disney, you know, Disney doesn't put new shows on stage. They put remountings of very successful movies on stage. They put Frozen on stage, Lion King on stage, Beauty and the Beast on stage, right? So, uh, unfortunately, I think now producers aren't willing to, to take risks like they used to. Broadway shows, Rodgers and Hammerstein, when, when Rodgers and Hammerstein wrote The Sound of Music, their biggest hit to date, which I think is 1964, that show cost half a million dollars, $500,000 to produce it on stage, which at the time, of course, was a lot more money. I don't know exactly what the conversion would be. But unfortunately, theater now, too, uh, has a lot of red tape that didn't exist. Uh, now, almost everyone involved with the Broadway show is a member of a union, whether that be a musician union, an acting union, a stagehand union, a director's union, a choreographer's union. They all have unions, and they all have that red tape that comes along with them where they must have work a minimum amount of hours a week. They have to be paid whether they work those minimum hours, right? All of the things that come with unions, both the good and the bad, of course. But of course, the bad part of that is that it often prices out shows from happening. And so once upon a time, hiring someone like Richard Rogers to write you know, an original new musical for you, that seemed like a much, uh, it wasn't nearly as risky of an investment as it is today, and that unfortunately is why you see a lot of not original content get produced on stage because it's, it's the, you know, the more surefire bet. But I do have faith in the American musical. I do think that there are still people that actually are writing in the styles that I fell in love with as a kid. Um, I get to, on occasion, work with people on those shows. Uh, this new musical I have coming to Broadway in two months, Hades Town, is an example of that. It's an original musical that I actually really believe is legitimate. I think the music is fantastic and the storytelling is unique. But you're correct, yes. The ma majority of stuff that opens on Broadway today, uh, is the quality of it is not nearly as high as it once was, sadly. To get a show to Broadway, yeah. So much longer than you'd ever think. So for example, that show Hades Town that I just mentioned, I cast the first reading of it, table reading of it, over five years ago. So over five years ago, a producer called me and said, Benton, there's this new show I want you to help cast. Here's a script. There's nothing else. There's not a MP3 of the music. There's not a VHS or DVD for you to watch. There's nothing. Just read this script and call me tomorrow and let's talk about ideas to, for these roles, to bring these roles to life. That was five and a half years ago. Uh, and, and since then, over the past five and a half years, we've done multiple developmental kind of workshops and readings of it, meaning like we're in a room just like this with no sets and costumes, just working on the material, trying to see what works, what doesn't work, right? We did our first regional production of it last, last winter, last year, about right now, actually, uh, in Edmonton, Canada, which was super intentional. We put it in the middle of nowhere, Canada, try to keep everybody away from it so that people wouldn't come and review it and kind of get an opinion of it before it was ready to have an opinion. Um, and then we developed it more, and then we opened it this past fall in London, and now we're lucky. This show actually is getting a Broadway theater and is going to actually be finally a Broadway musical five and a half years later. But I can tell you that over you know, the nine years I've been doing this, I have cast dozens, me personally, I'd say probably close to 30 or 40 now, developmental shows that have never seen the light of day, that have never left a rehearsal room, they, people, for a million different reasons, sometimes because they weren't any good, sometimes because they were really good, but unfortunately, like, the wrong person was in charge of it, um, sometimes because the material wasn't commercial enough that, although it was really beautiful, 
producers got really cold feet because they were concerned about comparing the show to, you know, Frozen and Beauty and the Beast. Um, but that is so normal. And, but that honestly is one of my favorite parts of my job is getting to work on those new shows that no one ever sees the light of day of. It's when I get to be my most creative. <laughs> Good question, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there are totally other people from Wayne County that have made their way to New York. Um, most recently, there's an actor named Jamal Williams who uh, did Stage Struck, who's many years younger than me. I bet he's easily probably 10 years younger than me. I mean, not quite 10. Uh, and he's living in New York. He has an agent. He pounds the pavement, auditions for me on a regular basis. I've cast him in a show before, uh, an out-of-town show, a production in Boston. Uh, but also, yeah, there are a handful of other people that have, have made that kind of trek to New York, for sure. I think that's a good ad for stage drama. <laughs> because there, there are so many people in here, I think, who gave their heart and soul for year after year after year, whether it was working on costumes or sets or uh, marketing, whatever. And look what you guys have done, because of uh, all the work that you put into it. Um, I think it's really benefited not only the kids at that moment that they were participating in the stage truck, but for those who chose to continue with it because there have been a lot of successful. And as I'm sitting here, I'm looking at these young people and I think, aren't y'all the stage truck? You are in the process right now of working on the beauty of Speaking of the devil, beginning the beast. <laughs> yeah. And, and I would love to give y'all a chance to ask them some questions too because I, I hope that um, I hope that there's not shy one so much. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Mm -hmm. um, recently I've been visiting a lot of different theater schools and one of the uh, common things for all of them is they're saying that casting in New York especially has changed. It's not they're not casting by type anymore. Mm -hmm. They're not you need to have a look like the army. Mm -hmm. How do you see that as a casting director? How are you That's real, for sure, yeah. I mean, Goner, again, another way that theater is trying to catch up with the rest of our country and the rest of the world is to actually depict what the rest of our world looks like on stage. Let's be honest, for a long time, entertainment in our country showed a very specific romanticized story of the American dream. And that isn't the reality of what our country is. And I think that Hamilton actually is a really great example of taking a story that we once thought was very specifically uh, the white man's story and actually realizing that it's not at all. And that show really broke a lot of, of types in our business. And now uh, people that would never have been considered to be the romantic you know, ingenue are, are getting an opportunity to do it. And uh, yeah, that, that is really common. And in fact, actually, what's really funny is we call it the Hamilton effect. And uh, what's, what's it's funny is seeing the shows that actually feel very dusty and dated, how they are trying to actually update themselves to actually compete with something like Hamilton. This past year on, on Broadway, there was a revival of Carousel, right, which takes place in a New England town and it, with New England good like Anglo-Saxon Protestants and uh, that all have, you know, like Irish backgrounds. Um, and in this revival, they, they represented you know, a multitude of, of races and, and ethnic backgrounds on stage. Um, and it, it all of a sudden gave so much more relevance to the material. It, it lifted it in a new way, and we heard it in a different way for the first time. Um, and that's absolutely happening. And that is a really exciting part of my job, is actually getting to be a part of that. Yeah? You said like, there are multiple occasions where you've had to turn people down because it's not based on talent. Right. And there are millions of cases where it's focused on something else. Where are some of those? Yeah, well, just, you know, I mean, I'm sure you probably feel it here in Goldsboro where you actually like, she didn't deserve that part. She got that part because she's better friends with X, Y, and Z, right? Like that, you know. Well, that's the Goldsboro version of that. Well, that Work, of course, that is, that's just human nature, right? We still always are going to want to hire the people that we feel like, you know, uh, validate our decisions the most and make us feel the safest. And so 
I deal with that. A big part of my job is kind of being a social worker in that way of kind of dealing with all the multiple personalities and egos and different you know, creative team members and producers I work with. I have to make them all feel like they all came to this decision together. They all agree on this decision and they're all going to sign right here on this decision so that I can go home. Um, but th that, I mean, th you'll, you'll realize like, that, that it comes into effect in all aspects of your life for the rest of your life. And so it's, it's important to kind of be able to realize that and figure out how you actually can, can use that you know, to your advantage in a healthy way and uh, successful way. But yeah, that's real. And that's it's usually due to you know, who somebody knows. Uh, the hour is over. Just like and that. We're going uh. to have a wonderful uh, reperception afterwards. And then we will still be here if you have something that you'd like to ask me personally. So I want to thank everybody for coming. And um, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you for coming.